Sir Joshua Reynolds, who founded the Royal Academy of Arts. During his time, two female academicians were admitted, but the lady I want to talk to you about, Lady Elizabeth Butler, was not. Let's come and talk about her, shall we? You see, Lady Elizabeth Butler lived in the Victorian era and indeed had a friendship with Queen Victoria. And I want to talk about that Sadly, sooner. the two pictures that I want to talk about that she painted are not on display anywhere in London. They are part of the Royal Collection, but not currently on public display. But she made such a splash here with one of them that I thought this would be the ideal place to talk to you about her. I'm Fiona Jane Weston, and I'm an actress and singer and passionate about sharing women's stories. If you like history and performing arts, please like and subscribe. Elizabeth Thompson, later to become Lady Butler, was born in Lausanne, Switzerland in 1846. She painted this portrait of herself in 1869. Though as an artist she concentrated almost exclusively on military scenes, there was nothing military or imperialist in her background. Her father inherited his fortune on condition he didn't work. So her parents, who were introduced to each other by Charles Dickens, devoted themselves entirely to their two daughters' education, which involved a lot of travel in Europe. They stayed mainly in Italy, but it was in France that Elizabeth became fascinated by their military pictures where there was a much greater tradition of it than in England. Even as a young girl, she did sketches of soldiers. She also saw the opportunity to stand out as a painter. She said she hoped to distinguish myself from the ruck. She did get into the female school of art in South Kensington, London, but didn't like it very much as they wanted her to concentrate on patterns and design. Her mother, who was a concert pianist, was said to be quite distressed that her eldest daughter wanted to paint nothing but soldiers and battles. But Elizabeth said, One day they shall hear of me. Well, it took 12 years, but when that did happen, it happened overnight. In 1873, she had a painting called Missing, accepted by the Royal Academy. But, instead of being placed on the line, where people could see it, it was scarred, which meant that hardly anybody really noticed it. I'll show you a demonstration here with a more modern painting from uh, the current exhibition at the Royal Academy. See what it's like? Really high up, having to crane your neck to have a look at it. But it was noticed by a northern industrialist called George Galloway, and he decided to commission Elizabeth to paint a picture about the Crimean War, which had taken place some 20 years earlier. Now, the Crimean War had been a terrible, terrible war, and many of the ordinary foot soldiers came back in a very bad state, having been somewhat ill-treated, actually, by the high-ranking officers. This was still very raw in the public's imagination, and there was still talk of military reform going on. Well, she painted what became known as probably her most famous painting, popularly called Roll Call. And when this was displayed, believe me, it caused a sensation. Even the great art critic John Ruskin, whose critique could make or break any artist's reputation, said he was forced to admit that he had to take back his fateful words that no woman could ever paint. Well, at least he admitted he was wrong. Right. Well, it was so popular, the crowd flocked to it, and they had to station a policeman to control the crowd. She said herself, I awoke this morning to find myself famous. Well, the Prince of Wales wanted to buy it, but Galloway wasn't ready to part with it. Eventually, it was agreed that it would be sent to Queen Victoria to view it. Something that had never happened to a picture at the Royal Academy before, so a great honour. For well, then she wanted to buy it, and Galloway could hardly refuse her. So it was agreed 
that Elizabeth would paint another picture for him. But by now, she had become much more business savvy. She upped the price from the original £126 to £1,126. Thank you! So what was it that so captured the imagination of the public? Unlike hitherto war paintings, which showed the heroic poses of high-ranking officers, this shows the reality of war, grim and suffering. Officially titled Calling the Roll After an Engagement Crimea, the painting depicts ordinary soldiers, not officers, exhausted, badly wounded, dead and dying. A man has collapsed, possibly dead, another rests on his crutch, and vultures are flying overhead. Although the British had won the Crimean War, it was seen as a disaster for the common soldier who had been neglected and ill-treated by the officer classes. Even nearly 20 years later, emotion still ran high about it, and the need for military reforms was much discussed. Queen Victoria herself had been much troubled by the plight of the soldiers in that war, which she said had been won by their persevering valour and chivalrous devotion. Elizabeth came within two votes of being elected the first female associate academician. She still didn't get it. That honour was not to happen for another 50 years to a woman, and that went to Annie Swinnerton in 1922. And the first full member to be elected was Laura Knight in 1936. Elizabeth became Lady Butler when she married Lord William Butler, a British army officer. And so she went travelling again because he went on a lot of military campaigns. And it was then the Queen Victoria herself commissioned Elizabeth to paint more contemporary battle scenes. And in 1879, she produced the defence of Rourke's Drift. The Battle of Rourke's Drift was one of the battles of the Anglo-Zulu Wars of 1879 and one of the most heroic defences of a station and field hospital ever fought. On January 22nd, a group of 140 exhausted, injured and sick British soldiers limped their way into the camp where there was a military hospital. They had lost a battle that day in Izan Dilwana, and although the commander of the Royal Engineers had set up a force to defend the fence, over 4,000 highly trained and well-equipped Zulu warriors, heartened and pumped up by their earlier success, came to attack the station. They charged so quickly and powerfully, the small number of British was unable to shoot them quickly enough. Also, as can be seen on the right of the picture, the Zulus rained down spears wrapped in burning grass onto the thatched roof of the hospital. The sick and dying had to rush out, join the battlements and engage in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. They were forced to retreat to a smaller compound on the edge of the perimeter, hastily erect a barricade of boxes and fight from behind there. The fighting raged for over 10 hours. The camp was destroyed the hospital burned to the ground and 400 of the 4,000 Zulu warriors were killed. The British lost 17 of their 140 soldiers, with 10 wounded, but they were finally able to hold the fort. Nine men were awarded Distinguished Conduct Medals and 11 received the highest possible military honour, the Victoria Cross. That was the highest number for a, ever for a siege battle. Each of the VC holders are depicted here in the painting. On their return to England, the soldiers first visited Windsor and then Lady Butler went down to Portsmouth where they were stationed. There, as was her usual practice in painting battle scenes, she got the men to reenact as realistically as possible the events that had taken place. She said they staged the representation, dressed in the uniforms they wore on that dreadful night. The result was that I reproduced the event as nearly to the life as possible, and that she had managed to show in all that scuffle 
all the VCs and other conspicuous actors in the drama. If you look at all the faces here, you'll see that once again she is focusing on the ordinary men more than anyone. When Queen Victoria saw the painting, she said, All officers and men are portraits, and everything is painted from descriptions, and just as it was, down to the very smallest detail. Elizabeth was later to recall, I was counselled to give Her Majesty the description of every figure. She spoke very kindly and in a very deep guttural voice, and showed so much emotion that I thought her all too kind, shrinking now and then as I spoke of the wounds, etc. I find this relationship between Queen Victoria and Elizabeth fascinating. Elizabeth was not born from nobility, and yet, clearly her pictures moved the Queen. Both were very interested in the ordinary soldier. Yes, the Queen too. These pictures were not of the jingoism and overly aggressive stance that was so popular at that time, not just in the art world, but in society in general. And Queen Victoria was wanting her subjects to actually serve her with loyalty and love, not out of a sense of pure duty. And as for Elizabeth, she said, I did not paint for the glory of war, but to portray its pathos and heroism. If you like this content, please remember to like the film and also to subscribe to my channel. If there's anyone in particular, any woman of history that you would like me to cover, please get in touch by all means, either here on the YouTube channel or in my email address, which I will leave in the comments for you below. In fact, this very film was suggested by a fan who wanted me to talk about the defense of Rourke's drift and it led to all of this research which I've loved doing.